Hi, welcome back to The Progressive Permanentist, where we believe the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. One of the distinctive features of Churches of Christ is a cappella worship. And one of the main arguments for this practice is the argument from silence. In short, we speak where the Bible speaks, and we're silent where the Bible is silent. And so because the New Testament says to sing and it is silent in regards to instruments, we conclude that we are to sing without instruments. But is this the only argument for unaccompanied singing in the assembly? You are watching one of a series of six lectures where Ashby Camp will be arguing that there is far more to the argument than just the argument from silence. Hence the name, Beyond the Argument from Silence, a Covenantal View of a Cappella Worship. Ashby Camp is more than qualified to speak on the subject. He graduated from the University of Florida in 1974 with high honors and from the University of uh, Duke Law School in 1977. He later graduated in 1990 from the Harding School of Theology with his Master's of Divinity. In 1989, he was the recipient of the Velma R. West Greek Award, and in 1990, he received the MDiv Academic Award. So as we said, Ashby is far more than qualified to speak on the subject. We hope that you enjoy these lectures. All right. Now, as I have said repeatedly, the scholarly consensus that the church didn't use instrumental music in its worship for many centuries, that's based on the New Testament and on the non-canonical writings of early Christians, with the one exception of the pagan Pliny, who also gets thrown in the mix. Now, last week, all right, last week we saw that the pagan governor Pliny writing to Emperor Trajan around A.D. 112, and the Christian apologist Justin Martyr, writing around A.D. 155, they spoke of Christians singing in worship, but again, just as in the New Testament, they made no mention of instruments or musicians or instrumental music. And we saw that Clement of Alexandria, he made clear in his writings in the late second century that Christians did not use instrumental music in worship. And in fact, he echoed Paul's description of instruments as lifeless, and he made clear the pejorative connotation of that description, saying Christ despises the cathara and lyre as they are but lifeless instruments. Then we looked at a number of major theologians from the 4th century, from the 300s, and those theologians included uh, uh, Eusebius and John Chrysostom, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Ambrose, all of whom confirmed the church's rejection of instrumental music in worship. And then when we ended, uh, I just read a quote from Nicaea. Now, Nicaea was a Latin-speaking leader of the Western church, and he writes in the early 5th century, so now we're in the early 400s, and I gave this quote to you, I want to read it again and then we'll go on, but Nicaea says, only what is material from the Old Testament has been rejected, such as circumcision, the Sabbath, sacrifices, discrimination in foods, and also trumpets, cathars, cymbals, and timpana, which now understood as the limbs of a man resound with a more perfect music. Daily ablutions, new moon observances, the meticulous inspection of leprosy, along with anything else which was temporarily necessary for the immature, are past and over with. But whatever is spiritual from the Old Testament, such as faith, devotion, prayer, fasting, patience, chastity, and psalm singing, has been increased rather than diminished. Now, Theodoret, so that's Nicaea, who's a Latin-speaking leader of the Western Church. Theodoret is a Greek-speaking leader of the Eastern Church, who also wrote in the 5th century in the 400s, a little bit later than Nicaea. And Theodoret says, it is not singing in itself that is characteristic of immaturity, but singing to lifeless instruments. Lifeless. You remember Paul referred to lifeless? The instruments as lifeless? He says, but, but, but singing to lifeless instruments and with dancing and rattles, 
Therefore, the use of these instruments is excluded from the song of the churches, along with other things which characterize immaturity, and there is simply singing itself. All right, so what I started out with, I gave you the scholarly consensus, and I've been trying to show you what's that based on. So you didn't just have me reading all these quotes of these scholars. And I tell you, it's based on the New Testament and on these non-canonical writings of early Christians. And what drives it, the force of that, is that it's inconceivable that the church in the centuries after the apostles would uniformly and vehemently condemn the use of musical instruments if they had been used in worship in the apostolic churches or in the early second century. If such a complete reversal of viewpoint had occurred, a shift from apostolic acceptance to universal church rejection, if that had occurred, well then certainly there'd be some discussion of the switch in the, in the literature of the early church. You wouldn't go from acceptance to universal rejection and have no, no discussion of that in the literature of the early church, but there is none. There's nothing about that. And the most reasonable conclusion is that it was not necessary for later writers who condemned the use of instruments in worship, condemned the use of those to, to address or to deal with their use in apostolic churches because instruments were never used in Christian worship. In other words, the record is one of continuity of rejection rather than acceptance and reversal. So that's what drives the scholarly consensus. It is the New Testament and it is these early Christian writings. Now, most proponents, most advocates of instrumental worship acknowledge the uniform absence of instrumental music in Christian assemblies for centuries. But a few, largely on the internet, they deny the scholarly consensus. They claim, oh, there's abundant evidence of Christians using instruments in worship during the first thousand years of the church. That is not true. Okay, that is not true. And I have written a paper that's 31 pages long, and I'm not going to go chase all of these things. You can go read it. It's on my website, theoutlet.us. The paper is titled, Assessing the Evidence Offered for the Use of Musical Instruments in Early Worship. And in that paper, I address 21 alleged indications of instrumental usage in worship in the first 700 years of the church and show that none of them support that claim. Indeed, if there was persuasive evidence for the use of instruments in worship in the early church, then the current scholarly consensus that the church didn't use instruments wouldn't exist. You see, it's like, oh, oh, these people who are doing this, they're all hacks. You see? And you have to realize the scholarly consensus is made up of scholars from traditions that today use instruments. So they don't have an axe to grind to say, no, we have some bias. It's broad. It's from all these different theological groups. So I, I'm aware that you'll run across that sometimes. I note that paper to you. If that's of interest to you, go read that. But I'm simply telling you that, that there is this consensus, and I now have given to you the reason that is behind that consensus. Now, it's worth noting that even in the Roman Catholic Church, there were periodic complaints about the use of musical instruments. For example, Aylred, who was a 12th century monk, who headed a monastery in Yorkshire, England. He said, we are not now considering those who are openly bad. We will speak to those who cloak their sensual delights with the pretext of religion, who turn to the service of their own vanity, what the ancient fathers religiously exercised as a figure of future things. But now the types and figures are come to an end. How comes it? I like that language. How comes it that the church has so many organs and symbols? 
To what purpose is that terrible blowing of bellows imitating rather the crash of thunder than the sweetness of the human voice? This is in a 12th century monk. So it's not like when the Catholic Church accepted instruments, everybody said, boy, what took you so long? It wasn't, it wasn't like that at all. Problems relating to the use of instrumental music, they were debated at various councils of the Roman Catholic Church in the 1500s and again in 1903. And we come to the Protestant Reformation. Now, the four dominant figures of the Protestant Reformation were Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, and John Knox. Those are the four major theologians of the Protestant Reformation. Three of them, Calvin, Zwingli, and Knox, all rejected the use of musical instruments in Christian worship. Now, Luther's position is, is more difficult to pin down as he hardly mentioned instruments, and he often was critical of them, but it seems he was more open to their use, more in line with retaining that from Catholicism. So you know, we know that by the end of the 16th century, the late 1500s, we have an example of an organ being used in instrument in, in conjunction with, with worship in a Lutheran church, but in the Reformed branch of the Protestant Reformation, it was centuries until instruments came into churches from that branch. And when they did come in, it was highly contentious. People didn't just say, oh, this is a great thing. It was highly contentious. But ultimately, they, they came in, and now we live at the very tip of a long thing, and we look around and say, everybody uses instruments. Historically, that's not true. It's a very, uh, it's a very recent phenomenon. In fact, there are, there are today, there are still today, Reformed, Presbyterian, and Baptist churches, in addition, in addition to the Eastern Orthodox churches and some others, that do not use instrumental music in worship. Churches of Christ are not the only ones. But you'd never know that, the way it's portrayed. Now, in the English Reformation, you remember the English Reformation? It's a little bit different because during the first part of the 16th century, during the reign of Henry VIII, you had the Anglican Church formed in response to that whole Henry VIII situation. So it breaks off from the Roman Catholic Church, and the Anglicans continued to use instrumental music in conformity with the Roman Catholic Church. But in the 18th century, okay, so that's 16th century, in the 1700s, you have the Methodists, you know, with Wesley. The Methodists arose originally as an attempt to reform the Anglican Church. And the Methodists rejected the use of instrumental music. It wasn't for a long time, century or more, that instruments then came into the Methodist church. But you have Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, no instruments. That reform branch comes off and it's centuries until they get introduced. You have the Anglican church that uses instruments in conformity with Catholicism. The Methodists come up and say, we're going to reform the Anglican church, no instruments. And then it's a while before instruments come in. So this is all really uh, Johnny-come-lately stuff. But you'd never know that. You'd think that not using instruments was something that a couple of harebrained people in the 19th century came up with. And we just follow it because we're stupid. And it's just not true. It simply isn't true. It's no wonder that in his book... Acapella Music, the church historian Everett Ferguson, he concludes his section on the history of instrumental music in worship with the following. The classical form of church music is unaccompanied song. To abstain from the use of the instrument is not a peculiar aberration of a frontier American sect. Now that's what many people in churches of Christ have been raised to believe. That this is something that popped up in the 19th century. You know, when you had, the, you had churches of Christ 
growing rapidly and all of this, Alexander Campbell, all of that, they got onto this idea and we simply inherited it from them. That is nonsense. Okay, he goes on, he says, this was easily, easily until comparatively recent times, the majority tradition of Christian history. Do you feel like you stand in the majority tradition of Christian history when you don't sing with instruments? Or do you feel like you're some kind of peculiar, weird, uh, you know, out of the mainstream thing? Well, today you may be. But when do we start looking at the church? By today. All right, he goes on. He says, virtually no one has said it is wrong to worship a cappella, whereas many have thought instrumental music in worship is wrong. It may not appear to be true today, but against the whole sweep of Christian history, a cappella music is the truly ecumenical, the truly unifying ground to occupy. Everyone can join us, but there are many people like yours truly who cannot join those who wish to worship with instrumental music. Everybody can join without it. So it really is truly the ecumenical ground to occupy. All right, now, this brings us to this question. Given that instrumental music, instru instruments, given that instruments were inexpensive, portable, and were used widely in Greek, Roman, and Jewish cult cultures, and especially in religious activities, why were they universally absent from early Christian worship? I mean, isn't that a big question? Why were they universally absent from early Christian worship? As Ferguson says in his book, The Instrumental Music Issue, where something was available and every assumption would seem to favor Christian adoption of the practice, and yet there is complete evidence of the rejection of the practice in the post-apostolic period, there's every reason to look to a deliberate choice made in the apostolic age. A person must have a very good explanation in order to think that instruments were authorized in the New Testament, but were not used by Christians for many centuries after the New Testament. You see, that's the question. You would expect them to be using them. Everything points to they would adopt their use, but they didn't. Now, why? Why didn't they? You see, and I'm first going to address two inadequate explanations for the absence of instrumental music in early Christian worship. And then I will argue to you that the best explanation is that instruments were understood correctly to be excluded by the teaching of Christ and the apostles that came to be expressed in the New Testament documents. Well, what, is, what, is the, what are these inadequate explanations for the non-use of instruments in early Christian worship? Well, some have su suggested that the absence of musical instruments in worship in the early church was not because of any theological objection to their use, but because the church opted not to use them. The church opted not to use them in light of their widespread use in paganism and Judaism. In other words, their, their non-use was a preference, an optional judgment driven by the church's desire to distinguish itself from paganism or Judaism in the circumstances of the first century. Now, there are good reasons to doubt that. There are good reasons to doubt that. As for avoiding association with pagans, I showed early on, I showed that instruments were prevalent in temple worship and in Jewish life. In fact, the case can be made that the Jews considered themselves particularly musical people. Now, so if instruments, they're, they're not especially associated with pagans. They weren't linked to them. Indeed, you could make the case, certainly in the mind of the first disciples, 
who were Jews, that they were especially linked to Judaism. And since they were not especially linked to paganism, use of instruments would no more associate the church with paganism than with Judaism. So fear of, of being associated with paganism can't explain why the early Christians didn't use instruments. Let me illustrate it for you, the point I'm trying to make with that. Since driving cars isn't especially associated with Texans, people from everywhere drive cars, Arizona, Florida. Drive, since driving cars isn't especially associated with Texans, if somebody abstains from driving a car, there's no reason to believe he is doing so to avoid being considered a Texan. Do you see the idea? Because it's not particularly associated with Texans. So the idea that they would abstain because it's that so they wouldn't be associated with pagans requires the notion that instruments are specifically associated with pagans, and that's not true. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Now, for, for avoiding association with Judaism, as for that, the church had no qualms about accepting some practices of Judaism as optional Christian practices. Lifting hands in prayer, circumcision, abstaining from non-kosher food, like you see in Romans 14 and 15. The church didn't have any problem with adopting and accepting some practices from Judaism as optional Christian practices. So if instruments were theologically permissible, if that were the case, then fear of Jewish taint can't explain why the Christians didn't use them. I mean, the early church certainly was not averse to all things Jewish. Right? I mean, they could have adopted that just as they could adopt all these other things. You know, Paul circumcises Timothy. Well, Jews do that. Paul says, no, it's an optional Christian practice. You see, so that doesn't work. And then as for avoiding either one, either one, paganism or Judaism, it's hard to believe that the same preference would be exercised for 900 years in all the various cultures to which the church spread, right? I mean, if it was a judgment call, if it was a matter of preference, rather than an aspect of God's will, certainly in one of those places, at one of those times, a church would have had a different perception of the associations of musical instruments or weighed the negative connotations of those associations differently, especially given that instruments ceased to be part of Jewish worship after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Now the fact instruments were uniformly absent in all those places at all those times suggests that something other than a preference was at work. Something other than a preference was at work. Indeed, as some of the quotes I provided earlier, and I'm going to repeat some of them shortly in this different context, as some of those quotes indicate, the early Christian writers, they often gave a theological rationale for their rejection of instrumental worship that's rooted in the shift from old covenant to new. You see, so this idea that somehow it was to disassociate from pagans or Jews, neither of those makes sense to me. Neither of those carries any weight. I know the argument, I hear it, but I just say I don't believe it. It just doesn't carry weight for me. Now, other people, you have some scholars who believe the early church simply inherited the worship practices from the Jewish synagogue, which, unlike the Jewish temple, didn't use musical instruments. In other words, they believe the absence of instruments in early Christian worship was not because the Christians thought there was anything wrong with them, 
Not, you know, anything that there wasn't any problem with using them. Rather, the earliest Christians who were Jewish simply did what they were used to doing in the synagogue. And then that Jewish custom or that Jewish habit became standard Christian practice. So instruments, they weren't rejected. They simply were not used out of Jewish habit. Okay, there are good reasons to doubt that. Now, the first thing is, is contrary to what you may have been told and may have been told repeatedly growing up, contrary to that, there is no evidence of singing in the early synagogue. The first evidence for that comes centuries after the New Testament era. Now, that's important. Why is that important? It's important because if there's no singing in the early synagogue, then obviously the church added singing to whatever it may have inherited from the synagogue. And if the early church added singing to whatever it inherited from the synagogue, then the absence of instruments in the synagogue cannot explain their absence in church because instruments could have been added as easily as singing. You see, once you get to the point where you say, well, no, we're not bound by these things, we are adding things. Okay, well, if you added singing, now the question is, why didn't you add instruments? You see, that doesn't become an explanation for why they didn't have them. They added singing. And if they did that, they could have added instruments. So the question is, why didn't they? And the fact they weren't used in the synagogue gives you no explanation for that. But that's just the first reason I find the inherited from the synagogue explanation bad. But I want to, I want to show you some quotes here on this because this may be new to you. You may be thinking, no, this guy's crazy. They were singing in the early synagogue. Over 40 years ago, Ralph Martin, in his book, Worship in the Early Church, he said there's some doubt as to the extent to which singing of divine praises had developed in the Palestinian synagogues of the first century. Almost 20 years later, D.A. Carson says, it has been repeatedly shown that all the evidence for liturgy in the Jewish synagogue system is considerably later than the New Testament documents. We simply do not know what a synagogue service looked like in the first century. James McKinnon, who's the noted historian of music, or was the noted historian of music and liturgy, says in a paper that was published in 1980, he says, but what of psalmody? To state it as simply as possible, there was no singing of psalms in the ancient synagogue. The psalmody of the early synagogue is a myth fostered by a curious coalition of Anglican liturgists and Jewish musicologists. So we have Paul Bradshaw, who's emeritus professor of liturgy at the University of Notre Dame. He comments, liturgical and musical historians have tended to assert confidently that psalmody was a standard part of, early, of the early synagogue. There is, however, almost a total lack of documentary evidence for the inclusion of psalms in synagogue worship. And Michael Pepard, who is an assistant professor of theology at Fordham University, in his, in his article, Music, in the Erdman's Dictionary of Early Judaism, he says it is often suggested that psalmody played a central role in synagogue worship at the dawn of Christianity. There is not, however, demonstrable. This is not, however, demonstrable from the earliest sources. So this to me is significant, okay, for the reason I explained. If there's no singing, then you cannot use the synagogue as an explanation for why there's no, no instruments, because they added singing, they could have added instruments. Do you understand that? I hope. Okay. Now, second reason. The second reason, let me go back here. Well, I'll just p push ahead. The second reason to doubt that unaccompanied uh, singing in Christian worship was an optional practice inherited from the synagogue is that the, ch the church in Scripture is analogized to the temple, not the synagogue. It's analogized to the temple. You can see that in 1 Corinthians 3.16, 2 Corinthians 6.15, Ephesians 2.19-22, 1 Timothy 3.15, 1 Peter 2.4 and 5. As Bruce Chilton says in the Dictionary of New Testament Background, one sees in primitive Christianity, quote, 
the claim that a church at worship took the place of the temple. So it seems that if any Jewish practices were to be continued simply out of habit, it would be those of the temple rather than the synagogue. The third reason to doubt the inherited from the synagogue explanation is the uniformity of the a cappella practice. The apostles, you know, they refused to bind on Gentile Christians deeply held religion, deeply held Jewish practices that were rooted in the old covenant. Circumcision, food laws. You remember, they refused to bind those things on Gentiles even though they were rooted in the Old Covenant. So they certainly would not bind on Gentiles what was merely an optional practice of the synagogue. If they won't bind what's rooted in the Old Covenant, well, they're certainly not going to bind an optional practice of the synagogue. Now, why is that significant? It's significant, you see, because if unaccompanied singing was not something that was bound on the Gentiles, if it was an optional practice, then no doubt some of them would have introduced instrumental music into their worship. Some of them you would have had it. If it was optional and wasn't bound, well then certainly in all these places, some of them would have introduced it. So the use of instrumental music, it must not have been an option, which means that it... which. Wouldn't, wouldn't be true if the a cappella practice was merely an inherited synagogue preference. Then it would be a preference, an option, if they'd inherited it from the synagogue. But yet it has to be something bound, or you wouldn't account for the uniformity of the practice. So I don't find that very appealing. It's not because I grew up and, you know, became a Christian in this fellowship. That's not why. I didn't grow up, I was converted as an adult. That's not why. It's because as I think about these things, these explanations do not make sense to me. And that leads us to the fourth reason to doubt the explanation for the, that unaccompanied singing in Christian worship was a preference inherited from the synagogue. And this is that the, the, the early explanations of the practice, they don't mention the synagogue. I would, I would expect that when I saw the lack of use of instruments in the early Christian writers, if the reason for that was that we had just taken it over from the synagogue, I would somewhere get an indication of that. But you don't get that. When early Christians addressed the issue of why they didn't use musical instruments, when God had prescribed instruments for use in the temple, they didn't say, well, you know, we don't use them because of some connection with the synagogue. They didn't say that. On the contrary, they said, among other things, that instruments are unsuitable for worship in the new covenant because they are part of the more sensual, external worship of the old covenant, which was a mere shadow or type of the higher spiritual worship of the New Testament. Now, I've already given you some examples of this, but let me repeat them in this context. Now you know where I am. I want you to look at them through this lens. And you see, for example, Eusebius, this idea that we don't use them because they're not fitting, because what was fitting in the old, sensual, shadow covenant is no longer fitting in the higher, more spiritual worship of the new covenant. Okay, Eusebius, of old at the time, those of the circumcision were worshiping with symbols and types. It was not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the Psalterian and Cathara. We render our hymn a living Psalterian, a living Cathara with spiritual song. Do you see the transition? Old, new. You see here, John Chrysostom. I would say this about the mention of instruments in Psalm 149. That in olden times, they were thus led by these instruments because of the dullness of their understanding and their recent deliverance from idols. You see, he's looking back and saying it was okay and appropriate for them in their state. 
He says, just as God allowed animal sacrifices, which of course he doesn't do in the new covenant. He says, just as God allowed animal sacrifices, so also he let them have these instruments condescending to help their weakness. You see in Nicaea, which I read earlier, he says, only what is material from the Old Testament has been rejected. Such as circumcision, Sabbath sacrifices, discrimination, trumpets, cathars, symbols, timpana. Down here it says, temporarily necessary for the immature are past and over with. Anything else which was temporarily necessary. That was fitting for the old covenant. You see in Theodoret, it is not singing in itself that's characteristic of immaturity. What's happened? See, we've come into the higher, more spiritual worship. That's, that's what's happened. You see, they give a theological rationale. They don't say, well, we're just doing this because that's how they did it. They don't say that. You see, Isidore of Pelusium, who is a 5th century writer, Isidore says, uh, early 5th century, so early 400s, okay, says, if God accepted even sacrifice in blood because of the immaturity of men at that time, why are you surprised at the music of the Cathar and Salterium? He, say, he says, don't you see there was a difference? That there was a different order and a different difference connected in worship in this covenant? And what has happened now with the appearance of the Messiah and the new covenant? There is a difference that has spiritual implications so that what was once proper and fitting is no longer so. That's the context. So Everett Ferguson in his book, Acapella Music, Ferguson says, by the way, I had a quote. Ferguson has some books out now that I think are collections of things he's written in the past. But there is a uh, uh, emeritus professor of history, Wilkin is his name, at the University of Virginia. I should have uh, copied that for you. But anyway, I mentioned it to Meg. When you're talking about Everett Ferguson, he says that there's nobody who's been more, more highly received as a historian than Ferguson. And this guy, Wilkins, says even revered. So I'm letting you know Ferguson is, he, he's a big time church historian, okay? All right, he says, instrumental music, therefore, was an important feature of the temple worship. And it was closely associated with its sacrificial system. I'm going to show you that later. I know this stuff takes time. But that's just how it is. I can only talk so fast. And I have to, you see, all of this because otherwise you don't have, it doesn't make sense to you. But I want you to see, and this is very important, he says it was closely associated with its sacrificial system. That's going to be important. Here may be a significant clue explaining the absence of instrumental music in early Christian worship. And I can see Ferguson going, indeed it is. <laughs> yeah. I think it's key, okay? He says, early Christianity saw the sacrificial system and temple worship as superseded by the sacrifice of Christ and the worship of the church. When the Levitical priesthood and the sacrificial cultus, all of that stuff tied up with temple worship, when they were abolished, naturally, its accompaniments were too. Its accompaniments were too. They passed as the old covenant and its worship practices passed. Okay? Edward Foley. Foley, who's the uh, he, at Theological Union. Uh, he's a, a Catholic. He's a professor there at Catholic Union, I think is the name, in Chicago. But Foley writes in his book, Foundations of Christian Music, or Catholic Theological Union, I think. He said, I would suggest there, wasn't, there was an element of rejection. So he's a Catholic. I would suggest there was an element of rejection in Christianity's earliest assessment of instrumental music. A rejection wed to a growing rejection of the type of priesthood, cult, and re religious view embodied in the temple. Yes, I think we're on to something. Quentin Faulkner is a Steinhardt Distinguished Professor of Music at the University of Nebraska. He writes in his book, Wiser Than Despair, The Evolution of Ideas and the Relationship of Music in the Christian Church. As soon as Christianity moved beyond its earliest stage as a Jewish sect, 
then Christians rejected the idea and practice of temple worship entirely, discarding at the same time its sensuous, emotional, and spectacular character and its use of instruments in the liturgy. Thus, while Christian rejection of pagan customs discouraged the use of instruments in general, the doctrine of spiritual sacrifice eliminated them specifically from Christian worship. Christian writers often asserted that God had allowed the use of instruments under the Old Covenant merely as a concession to human weakness. And you saw that in some of the things that I've read to you. Joseph Losel, Losel is a reader in patristics and late antiquity at Cardiff University School of Religious and Theological Studies. In his book, The Early Church, History and Memory, Losel says church fathers argued against the use of musical instruments such as lyres, flutes, harps, trumpets, sisters, cymbals, and drums, and several church councils banned them. This was not only because of the association of these instruments with traditional pagan cults, but also because they tended to be seen as Judaizing elements. You see, this idea that they had their time, but now we have grown beyond that. We have grown beyond that, and we are people who worship in a higher, more spiritual way than they did in the Old Covenant. And so part of that is the rejection of instruments. Ben Ozuidem, who's Associate Professor Extraordinary of Church History at the Theological Faculty of Northwest University in South Africa, he says in his book, Hope and Disillusionment, a Basic Introduction to the History of Christianity, the New Testament church considered that a spirit-filled human voice was sufficient and that she no longer and, and she was no longer in need of the musical crutches of the Old Testament dispensation of shadows. So see, this is the deeper thing. I'm going to show you, uh, Lord willing, in, in, I'm trying to get through this. When I finish this, we're going to begin a study of the Gospel of Mark. Okay? But I don't want to rush through this so that all the effort's wasted. I have to take enough time to paint the picture and get you to see. Why did they think these? Where did this come from? Where did this idea, how could the early church, the apostolic church, right from Jump Street, have concluded that there was this difference between New Covenant worship and Old Covenant worship? And we're going to go to John chapter 4, and I think you'll find it rooted right there. So, neither a desire to distinguish itself from paganism or Judaism, nor the custom of the synagogue. Neither of those things, none of those things is sufficient to explain the early church's non-use of musical instruments in worship. Rather, the early church understood correctly that the use of instruments were excluded implicitly from Christian worship by the teaching of Christ and the teaching of the apostles as they were teaching here, and that that teaching that came to be reflected and expressed and recorded in what we call the New Testament. And the key to that, you see, the key, the starting point to appreciating that the New Covenant abrogated, did away with the external ceremonial worship rituals of the Jewish temple. The key to appreciating that is John chapter 4, 19 to 24. That's the starting point. And I'm just going to put it up here, read it, and then I think the bell's going to ring. But you see, I don't want you to have a seizure here looking at these colors, you know. But I, I'm trying to draw out a parallel. 21 and 23 are clearly parallel. And this has significant implications for how we understand what Jesus is saying. It is something I think we regularly misunderstand. Okay? But he says, the woman said to him, sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say, but you, meaning Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where it is necessary to worship. Obviously referring to the temple. See, was it the temple at Gerizim? Or was it the temple at Jerusalem? Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming. It is future. 
An hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You, meaning Samaritans, let me finish this, worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here. I'll tell you what that means next week, Lord willing. And is now here, he says, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is very interested in worship, and he's interested in us worshiping in spirit and truth. I want to flesh this out for you because it's very relevant to what we were reading from these early church people who were saying we have gone from this dispensation, which had these kinds of things, to this where we don't use instruments. And I hope I can make that clear to you. Thanks for hanging in. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this content and you want to see more of it, please leave a like on the video and be sure to leave a comment underneath telling us what you thought about the video. And please subscribe to our channel for more content like this. All right, I hope everyone has a great day.